wa ashaddu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam i begin in the name of allah the beneficent the merciful all praise is due to allah the lord of all the worlds and be witness that there is nothing worthy of worship worship except allah and allah alone and i bear witness that the prophet muhammad Ibn Abdullah is the last divinely sent messenger and the seal of the prophethood. Amin. Let me again be, uh, begin with a, a with a, an apology for the the late start. I had some serious technical difficulties on my end that uh, we're going to have to work on <laughs> uh, smoothing out for these future broadcasts. But uh, once again, I am very very happy to have my brother, Dr. Samuel Arian, uh, with me, with us, uh, for this very important broadcast. Um, Dr. Dr. El Arian, last week we uh, had a, a, a broadcast that featured both you and your daughter, Lena. And alhamdulillah, it was an excellent broadcast. It was an excellent conversation that we had. But unfortunately, we had some technical difficulties last week that uh, ended up causing us to lose the first part of that discussion, of that conversation. And, and that was a very important part of the conversation having to do with the, um, uh, the, 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 creation and evolution of an organization that you gave birth to by the name of uh, the official name, the National Coalition to Protect Civil Freedoms, um, modified uh, over the last couple of years uh, to uh, the Coalition for Civil Freedoms. And that conversation, you know, what went into the development of this organization, you know how it, you 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 it came to mind and and how it it came into reality was, uh, for me, a very important part of the conversation as as well as what this organization has been doing since its inception. So, I, I wanted to have you back so that we can walk back over that uh, path of of conversation once again. And, and have it as part of our archives, you know, for, for folks to be able to, who are not with us live, be able to reference back to and, and benefit from. So let, let's begin with that. What, how did the National Coalition to Protect Civil Freedoms come into existence? What, what, what were the circumstances for that? And, and, and you, you uh, of course, in answering that question, you're going to have to share some information about your own self, your own uh, history and struggle, please. First, thank you very much for inviting me again, Brother Mori. I always be having conversations with you. And uh, thank you for, for giving me this opportunity. And uh, I want to also salute our audience and tell them Ramadan Kareem and Assalamu Alaikum for everybody. Uh, if you Recall, back uh, before 9-11, we had to struggle for the banning of secret evidence when it was used against uh, overwhelmingly uh, Muslim, Muslim immigrants or people who were uh, in the custody of ICE uh, based on secret evidence. And we established a, a, an organization, we called it uh, National Coalition to Protect Political Freedom at the time because we thought that this threat is not going just to be used against immigrants but also eventually it will be used against citizens you know the use of secret evidence and that effort we were able to get over 40 organizations from all walks of life you know muslim non-muslim uh, uh, immigrants uh, labor uh, civil rights groups and so on and so forth and as i said at the end we were able to uh, uh, to get at least a, a part of the legislation passed through the judicial committee but we never had the opportunity to get it before the house because we had 9-11 and everything obviously was turned back. Uh, when I was in prison and I, I felt how much the community, the Muslim community for that matter, was very vulnerable, you know, uh, they, they were afraid of doing anything. And I was really waiting for them to do something, to, to fight back with this onslaught against uh, its, its own leaders uh, throughout and their communities and the FBI visits and, 
and this uh, atmosphere of fear and Islamophobia that's taking place, and there was lit very little action, especially when it came to defending uh, people who were innocent. Uh, they were they were being uh, charged and convicted on phony charges for the most part, on entrapment cases, and the whole exercise was to intimidate the community and instill fear in it. And I thought, why they are not doing anything? So when I was in solitary confinement, I remember I, I wrote a proposal about why don't you do something like this? And I sent it to my lawyer and uh, asking her at the time if she could convey that message to different people that I thought they could carry the torch. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. And then when I got out on, on uh, uh, house arrest uh, early in 2008, I had all kinds of, of visitors coming to me from the Muslim community and others, and I was always asking them why they're not doing any kind of effort. Everybody was having a lame excuse, but basically it came down to that they didn't want to be singled out uh, if uh, one organization would take the mantle and try to fight back this very thorny issue that they could be targeted by the government. So I thought, why can't we work together as different organizations, form another organization of organizations, and start fighting back? Even that proposal didn't carry through. So I had to basically uh, uh, in, uh, in, the spring, in the summer of 2010, I, I started looking up some of the organizations that were active on this front. You know, Project Salam was one of them. Your organization was another. And there were other organizations that they had some timid, you know, uh, uh, work in that uh, direction, you know, some lawsuits and stuff like that. So I, you know, including Center for Constitutional Rights, National Lawyers Guild, they have a lot on their plate, but this was part of, these cases were part of their uh, interest. So I invited everybody uh, to my home uh, where I was uh, under house arrest in August of 2010. And uh, we, you know, I gave them a proposal about that we need to establish an organization of organizations that can focus on these issues, the issues of uh, being targeted by the by the government based on manufacturing charges, charges that the, uh, the government itself manufactured in order to get people and instill fear in the community, you know, uh, to reach out to to to, uh, to prisoners and families because I felt that my 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 family felt that that they were abandoned at the beginning, you know, they didn't start getting embraced until after we won our case, and before that they were almost abandoned. And uh, I could see that also throughout, you know, the hundreds of people. I was, alhamdulillah, you know, with God's blessings, I was able to win my case not once, twice. But that's very, very rare. That doesn't happen. Most cases, people are railroaded. Uh, they don't have the adequate uh, uh, lawyering, you know, the, 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 the legal staff that is needed. These cases cost millions of dollars. Mine cost $1.3 million. Not a lot of people can afford that. They basically, a lot of them may even get... Uh, 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 government lawyers who may not put the adequate resources for them in order to win these cases, let alone even all the stacks are against them. At any rate, so we uh, we proposed that. Your organization was one of them. Uh, I think at the time we had like 18 different organizations, and thank God everybody uh, got excited and, and we started. I think the starting date is interesting and it sticks still in my mind was 10 10 10, October 10, <laughs> <laughs> October 10, 2010, when they had an inaugural conference and from there you know it started and uh, thank god this is the 10th anniversary i can't believe it's been 10 years yeah. 10 years and wow. the idea is still there it's still struggling for resources but we have very very dedicated people i think on this broadcast today you're going to have two of them one of the pioneers who've been there from day one who working day and night in order to defend the rights of not just prisoners of every american because these kind of uh, uh, violations that the government is committing. It's not going to stop at the door of the Muslim community. It's going to affect everybody because it, it gets normalized. Uh, and uh, and I think uh, over time, more people will be involved and I think we'll be able to make a difference, not only in the lives of the prisoners and families themselves, but also in other spheres, education, media, uh, law, and politics. These are the four areas that we need to be very uh, uh, active and in order to, to, to overturn uh, these injustices. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I um, um, something going on with the mic now, but, uh, I had the pleasure of, of, of being the, the conduit, uh, alhamdulillah, for the introduction made uh, between uh, our guests who are going to be with us in, in, in a few minutes um, and their organization, 
uh, to you and uh, NCPCF. Um, they had a similar situation up in the Albany area that uh, brought, ended up bringing them to my attention, me to their attention. We formed a, a relationship and uh, uh, out of that came this, this friendship that has continued to grow and to touch so many others. Um, but, but, but again, getting back uh, to you, uh, you know, last, last week, and I don't know if that was in the first 20 minutes of the program or if that came later in the program, the uh, reference that was made to what took place on Capitol Hill. Mm -hmm. um, that, that, I don't know, that may have come later in the program, but uh, uh, it, it touched upon the kind of influence that Allah had blessed you to have um, before you became the target that eventually took you out of commission, for lack of a better word. You know, that their, their, their intent was to take Dr. Samuel Arian out of commission. That very successful mobilization that took place on Capitol Hill and the many things that happened around it uh, was uh, a, a, an indication, you know, and leading all the way up to the elections, the presidential elections of, of uh, what was it, 2000, was it? Right. 2000? Yeah. Um, it just, you know, it, it was an indication of how prominent a voice you had achieved um, on behalf of the Muslim community, on behalf of what this country is to is supposed to theoretically represent as a as a land quote unquote of liberty and justice for all but with that success came the targeting um it began with your um your your your, your cousin it was right dr sam uh, dr mezzan on the jar your brother-in-law dr mezzan on the jar and then uh uh, it, it, you know, eventually it, 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 it came to you, the, the person that I believe was, was always the target. Um, talk a little bit about that, uh, uh, Dr. Alarian, before we segue over into this, uh, th this other part of the program where we bring in our other guests. Right. Well, I want to first of all, uh, also mention, uh, Stephen Caffey, that they were pioneers, I said, and at the time, as you said, you I think it was you who mentioned to me that they were holding a conference in Albany. And I sent my son and, and one of his friends to go there and, and look at them because I read uh, Steve's book at the time about Yasin Arif. And I, I, I thought these are the type of people that we would like to be part of this organization yeah. because they are committed mm -hmm. to, the, to, the, to, the, to the cause of justice, uh, as you were. Well, <clears throat> of course, after, after secret evidence, we went through uh, phases. You know, because we thought if, if the government can get away with, with this unconstitutional use, then they can get away with anything. So we were able to form different coalitions, but also we started different phases. The phase of education, public education at the time. We had a series of many uh, conferences and seminars, and, and then we went through the media. We were able to produce over 50 editorials against secret evidence. Actually, secret evidence was the, a, a term that we coined. The government used to call it classified information, but at the end of the campaign, right. everybody was calling it secret evidence, even the judge right. and the prosecutors. And when that happened, I thought, okay, once you win that battle, then we actually won. It's just a matter of cleaning up, because you you reframed the, the cause. And then we went through the the, uh, the 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 political phase in which we went and introduced. We got to know many con Congress honorable congressmen who believe that this is wrong and unconstitutional. They co-sponsored the legislation. We were able to get together and uh, and have what we called secret evidence summit in the in in Congress in the largest room. I remember one of the prominent Congress people, David Barnett, at the time. We had 700 people, you know, stand in the standing room only, uh, uh, supporting the banning of secret evidence. We had many, many, many Congress people and senators coming and showing up and denouncing that practice which was unprecedented because this, this practice was actually affecting Muslims. And then he told me that this is the largest crowd that's ever existed uh, outside the well of the house, which I think it was a statement to, to our effort. And then we were able to pass that through the Judiciary Committee. 
I get to know Henry Hyde, who was it was a Republican com uh, House, and we had to do a lot of cam you know campaigning with them in their district and others in order to get them to support us. And eventually, I got the chairman of the committee to embrace it and schedule it for a markup after a hearing. He scheduled actually a hearing. During the hearing, we had eight people testifying. On our part, we had David Cole, the constitutional lawyer. We had Greg Nujayam, the legal director of the ACLU. We had uh, uh, two victims, one sister, one sister of one of the victims, and an actual victim. And on the other side, we had American Jewish Congress, American Jewish Committee, ADL, and Stephen Emerson. That tells you who were actually against it. The government didn't, didn't, didn't even show up to defend its practice. And eventually, when we went through Judiciary Committee, the vote came 26 to 2 in our favor. This was unprecedented. It was called 2121. H.R. 2121 uh, for that uh, session of Congress. Then we went to the Senate and we introduced another one in the Senate. It was introduced by Spencer Abraham at the time, who's Republican, and Edward Kennedy from Massachusetts, as you know, the late Edward Kennedy. And then we went through uh, uh, intense lobbying to get it uh, on a fast track. Uh, during that time, I was also pressing both campaigns, you know, the, the Democrats, uh, Al Gore, and the, the Republican, George Bush. And no one was really giving us much attention. They will give us some nice words, but that's it. But towards the end of the campaign, it came pretty close. So we had a call. I had a call from one of my friends who's very close to Carl Rove. He calls me uh, one day in October, and he says, all right, it's crunch time. What can we do to get the endorsement of the Muslim community? Everybody was trying to get an advantage. And they called me because I was spearheading uh, that effort. So I said, it's pretty simple. What the, your candidate needs to do is to say, I'm against secret evidence and that I will uh, uh, support the legislation that is in Congress, because this will help me also in getting it through fast track, because the Democrats were afraid to push it if the Republicans are going to uh, use it uh, uh, politically. It was Trent Lott, I think, was the majority leader at the time. So if I can get the Republican nominee to endorse it, then obviously it could pass through. So he said, okay, and I didn't expect actually what happened the following day, which was the second debate. I thought he's going to have to say something on the stump speech, uh, on this, uh, or or maybe 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 a release a statement, but the second day he and Gore were sitting side by side with Jim Lehrer from BBS, asking Gore about uh, uh, racial profiling used against African Americans, and of course both sides denounced it. And then Bush added, he said, but there is another form of racial profiling, and it's used against Arabs and Muslim Americans, and it's uh, secret evidence, and it's wrong, and it must must be uh, uh, must must stop. And there is a legislation in Congress that needs to pass. So everything I asked for was told there before 62 million Americans. So the next, you know, the following that debate, I get a call from the same person, and he said, "I delivered. Are you going to deliver now?" I said, "Of course, you have every right. I mean, you, it's more than what I expected." So I called everybody in the Muslim community, and all the different organizations, and they agreed that this is this is uh, significant and that we, we must honor our commitment to, to get, uh, give him the endorsement, which we did. Uh, I might add also that all the organizations, all the major organizations uh, endorsed it, with the exception of the Coalition for Good Government, and they had a reason because they had strong... And when, that, when, when we endorsed the guy who was heading the Coalition for Good Government, which is the W.D. Muhammad group, he was sitting next to me and he said, uh, I understand why you're doing it, but we can't do it for particular reasons. You understand? This? Of course, I said, I understand because obviously they are allied with the Democrats. At any rate, we identified six states where we make a difference. One of them was Florida, where I was coming from. So I went back and we started organizing for, for the Bush campaign, basically based on that, in, on that stand. We didn't you know, talk about Palestine or Iraq or any other things that he stood for, which, which we didn't agree, because our assessment at the time was that every community, before it has a voice, political voice, it must win its civil rights battle. We identified secret evidence as being our civil rights battle at the time. And we thought if we win this, then we will be able to have a seat at the table where we can make a difference for different policy uh, uh, options, you know, for, uh, different uh, policy uh, situations, you know, including foreign and domestic. So we thought we must win this and we can, you know, actually, you know, after we endorsed, I get a call from my liaison with the Democrats and she begged me to rescind this. And I said, this is too li little too late. She said, we can get it from the Democrats. I said, okay, show me. We had some people in prison, get them out. This is Democratic uh, administration, it was Clinton. So she got me within two hours, a statement from Gore, signed by Gore, basically mm -hmm. promising me that he will look personally into the issue of my brother-in-law 
and that he will he is against secret evidence himself as a person and when when she sent it to me i said really this is too little too late so we went to florida we campaigned for bush and what happened is that it came down to uh, to florida the whole presidency came down to florida and bush eventually won by 537 votes obviously we delivered thousands of votes as a muslim community they did recognize this because they invited me a month later uh, actually two months later to the inauguration and on the eve of the inauguration i get invited with this my liaison with the with the republicans and he had uh, in his in that party three people who actually thanked me personally well, john sununu the uh, senior the guy who was uh, the chief of staff of the first president bush and uh, newt gingrich the former speaker of the house and tom davis who was the head of the congressional committee uh republic committee at the time and we then we said okay we need now to, for you to stop the use of secret evidence and they said of course so they went you know at the time it was jan ashcroft who became attorney general it took him a while to to to, uh, to confirm him but once he got confirmed he formed a committee to look into the matter and then i get a call back uh in august of that year august 2001 uh, telling me that they need to gather all the Muslim leaders at the White House. We're going to have this huge announcement to ban the secret, uh, the, the use of secret evidence. That day was 9/11, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. By the way, Karl Rove does mention this in his memoir on page 325, in which he says he doesn't say why, but he says that uh -huh. the Bush was going to meet with the Muslim leaders that afternoon. And that's something. Yeah. All right. Your the narrative you just shared. It 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 brought to mind the, the the importance of forming alliances um and and hopefully alliances that have more integrity connected to them than unfortunately some of the alliances that uh, you were uh, able to secure with some of these politicians um mashallah we we have with us two other Beloved friends, Kathy Manley and Steve Downs, both practicing attorneys. Um, actually, Steve is 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 semi-retired. He's officially retired, but he's not really retired. I mean, he's still yeah, he he is still operable in 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 the in the public sphere. And Kathy, of course, she she has her practice, and she is very much uh, active on both fronts. Uh, more the you organization. Up, I can't hear you. You you can't hear me. Can you hear? Can you hear me, Steve? I can hear you. Okay. Uh, you Great. can hear me. Okay. Something's wrong with Steve's mic. Yeah, me too. I can hear you fine. Okay. Something's wrong with Steve's mic. Um, but Steve's. Uh... Maybe, maybe a call. Uh, maybe so, uh, one one of the engineers can call Steve and 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 maybe uh, and work on whatever it is that's going on with his his. Mike, help him with it because uh, everyone else is hearing, but 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 him. Um, Kathy, why, why don't you why don't you start us out with uh, how you came to be uh, involved with um, this whole issue of you know uh, the, the the targeting of Muslims. You know, you had a had a very huge case in the Albany area uh, that um, resulted in the formation of uh, first the Muslim Solidarity Network and then Project Salam. Uh, uh, if if uh, if I understand the uh, if I'm if, if I'm recalling the the trajectory uh, uh, correctly, why, why don't you share some information on? On, on how you became involved in this this whole area of human rights struggle. Sure, thank you, um, Maury. It's great to be on the show. So back in 2004, um, Yasin Araf, who is the imam of a small inner city mosque in Albany, New York, was arrested on, in a sting operation along with um, his friend Mohammed Hussein, um, who was a co-founder of the mosque. And they didn't, they didn't do anything. They didn't um, even say anything um, to show that they knew anything illegal was going on with this thing. It was the most ridiculous thing. And I was working at the time for um, the lead trial attorney in the case, Terry Kinlan. 
So I was doing a lot of the background preparation and research, and I, I couldn't believe how little evidence there was against him in this sting case. And really, without going into the whole case, I'll just say that it was secret evidence and just the climate of fear post 9-11 that um, got him convicted and his co-defendant too, because there was basically no evidence, usually in sting operations, the targets, you know, everything's recorded and the informant will kind of coerce or manipulate the target into saying something bad, like, oh yeah, we should do this that you're saying we should do, basically. And there was nothing like that in this case at all. It was supposed to be money laundering based on a loan to from the informant to the co-defendant. And he was supposed to somehow know this is money laundering the informant was supposed to explain this, which he didn't really do. And Yassin's only role as the imam, his only role was to witness this loan, which is obviously something that Muslims do. It's in the Quran, you witness alone. Um, so that's all he was doing. And he was somehow supposed to understand that this was related to money laundering, related to money being given to a terrorist group, Jaish e Muhammad, which had no connection with Yassin, who's Kurdish and Muhammad, who's Bangladeshi, they, they didn't have any connection with that group at all. Um, so this was a very complicated sting operation where the FBI was trying to get Yassin because they thought he was somebody else, we found out later. And basically there was a lot of secret evidence, which we were never able to see until this day, even though the lead trial attorney, my boss at the time, he got a security clearance just so he could see that evidence. Mm -hmm. And he still didn't get to see any of it because the standard is if the evidence is not favorable to the defense, then the judge doesn't give it to the defense. You only get to see stuff that the judge thinks is, is favorable or exculpatory. But the problem with that is if there's false evidence that's saying that the client is somebody else, you have to be able to give that to the defense attorney so they can show its faults. That's the adversary system. That's the Sixth Amendment right to confront the evidence against you. This didn't exist in our case. We this There was this false evidence saying Yassin was somebody else, and it was um, not given to the defense, so we weren't able to show it was false. And so based on that secret evidence, the trial judge told the jury that the government had good and valid reason for targeting Yassin, and they were afraid to acquit him despite the lack of evidence. So they acquitted him for most of the account of the counts, but at the end they were too afraid based on that targeting instruction. And so he got convicted, and the co-defendant got convicted, even though he, he was just kind of the collateral damage. He was just used to get to Yassin, and he was the one that mm -hmm. received the loan, which he needed money. Um, and the judge knew that um, that Muhammad had no interest in supporting terrorism. He thought Yassin did have an interest based on this false evidence. So they both got convicted. They both got sentenced to 15 years. And just going through that case just totally opened my eyes to how unfair this is. And I, I actually thought at the time that it was unique, that there weren't other cases like this. So when I started looking into the other cases, I, I really, because I wanted to say, look, this stands out. All these other cases, these are really bad guys. This, this one's innocent. And when I started looking at the other cases, I saw, wait a minute, something else is going on here. None of these cases, these Muslims that are charged with terrorism post 9-11, none of them are actually terrorists. And it totally blew my mind, really. And I knew I wanted to stay involved. And I stayed involved for Yassin's case the entire time through the appeal process trying to go to the Supreme Court, trying to do post-conviction motions. When we got the new evidence showing that that it, it was um, that they thought he was somebody else who was later killed, we tried to go back to court. But meanwhile, I started looking into these other cases and we met Brother Maury somewhere in there when um, <laughs> actually early on, we started the Muslim Solidarity Committee, right? There were some people that were following the case all along and maybe I'll let Steve talk about that since he didn't get to say anything yet, if his um, if his uh, technical difficulties have been solved, maybe he can talk about the Muslim Solidarity Committee and the formation of Project Salam. And before before we uh, uh, get to Steve, I just want to say to the audience 
that um, usually there's a formal introduction. Um, because we got a late start, I, I've uh, you know decided to table that. But we're going to, when we post this for folk uh, to be able to access and to share with many others, we're going to have the uh, biographical sketches of, of each one posted with this video. Now, with that said, Steve, pick it up from where Kathy left off, yeah. please. Well, one of the things I, I want to say was that um, I met uh, Yassine down at the jail, and immediately it was apparent to me that he was a very unusual person. He was a charismatic person. He could not speak English very well, but he was a natural, gifted, born storyteller. And he was mad. He wanted to get his story out. He wanted people to know that he was innocent, that this was a, a frame up. And so I kind of worked with him on it and we began to do bail applications and things. And as he began to tell more and more of his story, it became more and more elaborate and the bail application was getting longer and longer. And finally I sort of joked, you know, at some point you're going to want to uh, write, <laughs> turn this into a book. And uh, so after he was convicted, I actually went down there and I pushed a bunch of yellow pads over to him and I said, uh, now it's time to get start, started on your, your book, on your story. And first he said he didn't want to do it and so on, but I could, I could tell he really wanted to do it. And uh, so the next time I came back, sure enough, he had already uh, filled up a whole yellow pad with, with uh, notes and, and uh, uh, sentences, not all in particularly good English, but um, <laughs> yeah. they, uh, I, I, my job was to translate what he was writing into standard English, and then we would pass it back and forth until we all agreed. And within six months, he had written a, a, a 500 page book. It was an amazing achievement. Um, and yes, a, and it was. really, well, one of my favorite books. I love this thing. It happened that there was a lot of people in the Capital District that were looking at the evidence and uh, as presented by the newspapers and in, in radios and so on, and just weren't buying this story. They just didn't believe it. And I have to say that uh, there was a, a, a solid group of people. Um, There's Carl Strock, the journalist, who just didn't buy it. There were uh, other folks, uh, the, the uh, Bethlehem Neighbors for Peace, uh, the Women Against War, that were just looking at this and saying, you know, this looks like, like profiling to us. We don't get it. Um, so that when he was convicted, um, two people, Kathy Callan and Mace Safar, called for a general meeting the day after to talk about what we could do. And about 50 people showed up. It was a really a, a huge response from the community to this. And uh, they immediately sat down and began to work out plans for how we were gonna take care of the families and how we were gonna represent the uh, community in the sentencing and how we were gonna make sure that the uh, defendants got to see their children and families while they were in jail and how the families are going to be taken care of. These were all things that were decided, I think, within a few days after the conviction. And that was the Muslim Solidarity Committee. They opened a bank account and they raised $14,000, I think, by the time of sentencing. And that was used to try to get the two families as independent as possible, as financially independent as possible. Mm -hmm. So uh, there was no, I, I would say at that point, Kathy Callan and Mae Safar were probably the two people that were most involved in uh, the uh, Muslim Solidarity Committee as far as terms of leadership. Kathy and I, of course, were both lawyers, so we had a special role to play in it. Uh, and then, of course, Jean Finley came along and she was the editor of Yassine's book. And later, Lynn Jackson joined us. Uh, and so that became the sort of the, core group of what we used to call the jihadi peace sisters the folks that were going to go out and... <laughs> that came out because may may was looking at the evidence at the trial and she said you know it's so annoying because the, the prosecutors always anytime somebody uses the word jihad they always emphasize it like it's you know death to infidels or something and they don't realize that it's just the word struggle you can yeah. struggle for all sorts of things you can struggle right. for peace Right. If we use that word constantly over and over again every day, <laughs> we desensitize the American public to the fact that this is not a bad word. It could be a beautiful word. 
Yes, and right. So out of that came the Jihadi Peace Sisters, the struggle for peace. <laughs> so uh, I love it. Honorary Jihadi Peace Sisters. <laughs> and I, I was able, they, they allowed me to join. I'm the sister with a beard. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, how did Project Salam come into existence? Uh, Kathy, that, Kathy, you tell the story. All right. Well, after um, we started looking at some of these other cases, it was a couple years later, um, we were in touch with Brother Maury, and we were in touch with... Um, some people in Syracuse, because there was a case in Syracuse of a doctor, an oncologist, who was set up in one of these really unfair cases, an Iraqi oncologist who had a charity to help children in Iraq when the sanctions was going on, were going on. So he was sending money to help children survive in hospitals and medical, medical care and things like that for children in Iraq, and it did violate the sanctions. Um, other people did that that were peace activists. They never got charged criminally. He did get charged criminally, and he got sentenced to 23 years. So there was that case that was super unfair, and then there was a case in New York City, Faisal Hashmi, Fahad Hashmi case. Right. There were a bunch of people organizing around that. That was another really unfair case, and they were all somewhat different from each other, but they were all really unfair when you looked into them. And so we started forming Project Salam to look at um, – not just the case we had in Albany, but to look at these other cases as well. And we had our founding conference, and I believe it was 2008. I always get the year mixed up. It was either 2007 or 8 um, at the Albany Law School. 2008. 2008. Um, and we had Lynn Stewart, the attorney Lynn Stewart, who was herself charged in a really unfair case. We had her as our keynote speaker. She, After that, she got convicted and sentenced to prison, and and got um, breast cancer that she had before it came back. She's a wonderful person. She actually mm -hmm. got out on compassionate release a few years before she died, and then she unfortunately passed away a couple years ago, but she was an inspiration to us and helped launch Project Salam. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. Uh, with, without question, Lynn Stewart, you know, may God rest her soul, she was a very courageous and in inspirational spirit. Um, Dr. Sammy Alarian spoke about the phenomenal, and I was there. It was truly, truly phenomenal standing room only in one of the largest spaces on Capitol Hill uh, for that um, that hearing on secret evidence that uh, uh, that he led. You know the the organization of you all had something on, on a much. It was a, a much smaller scale, but you filled the space on uh, city council. I was there in Albany for that, and I was deeply, <laughs> deeply impressed by not only the numbers that came out and filled up that space. I know it was probably one of the largest, if not the largest, uh, uh, communal responses to an, an, an Albany uh, a council hearing. Uh, that they've had, no doubt, in, 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 in the history of the council. But also, I remember the, you know, some of the uh, statements that were made by some of the council members. Uh, why don't you share with, your, uh, with, with the audience something about, uh, about that and what, what that was all about and what came out of it? Well, it started with an opinion from the uh, Inspector General of the Justice Department indicating that the, uh, there was no procedure in place to look through classified evidence to determine if any of it was favorable to the, uh, to the defendant so it could be turned over according to law. And he was recommending that they go back and look through all of these uh, prior cases to see if they'd failed to turn over any evidence that was uh, applicable. And we said, hey, this is perfect. This is our issue. This is exactly what we want. But we couldn't quite figure out how to uh, get it into the public view. And Lynn Jackson, who is our kind of political expert uh, in Albany, she knows all the local folks down there. <clears throat> she, uh, this was her moment of glory. She talked to one of the councilmen, Dominic Cost Calcellero, mm -hmm. and hatched the plan to, vote, to have a resolution of the Albany City Council supporting this uh, opinion from the Inspector General. And for, I would say, for the most part, the Muslim community had not been very much involved in local politics. 
But uh, when they, they had this opportunity, they really showed up. They came and we did a march with banners and the whole thing down to, to City Hall to uh, present this case to the, to the uh, City Council. And there were some really eloquent people involved in that debate. Uh, I remember Leila Duca, who I think was about 12 years old at that time, mm-hmm. and it turned into a formidable orator. Uh, she was there, uh, you were there, uh, we had, uh, Maury was there, um, and all, just a, an enormous number of people mm-hmm. had come from all over. And afterwards, we talked to the members of the city council, and they said they had never in the whole life had, had experienced such an emotional, such a meaningful debate in which they felt that they were really a part of a very important um, issue that had to be resolved. And they all kind of thanked us afterwards and said what a great uh, event that was. Um, but, and they passed it, uh, 10 to, with I think two abstentions. And we tried to get other cities around to uh, follow suit. And we just didn't have the same dynamics. We couldn't seem to pull it off, or we just never got beyond the Albany one. You, you want to say anything about this, Kathy? Uh, no, it was, it was really amazing. And what the, the president of the Common Council said was she had seen um, people come before them before and have mothers talk about their sons who are in prison. Mm-hmm. And but she had never seen a little child. This was Leila Duca. Yeah. Uh, to get their father out of prison and it, she just started crying the, everybody was in tears it was really powerful and and for those um leila duca is 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 the the daughter of one of the duca brothers out of the case out of new jersey um this was the so-called fort dix five case and it was one of those right. uh, terrible terrible miscarriages of justice in the name of national security and a so-called war on terrorism that took three brothers from one family, one of them being the father of Leila Duca, three brothers from one family, and then uh, two other uh, brothers from two other families. And, and uh, uh, you know, at the end of the day, giving them outrageous sentences for uh, what the government claimed was aspirational offenses and it is just a ridiculous ridiculous case um brother sammy um i know that you have kept as close as you possibly can to the workings and 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 of of the coalition for civil freedoms from where you are in turkey and um, wh- how, what are your thoughts on how it has developed uh, to date? The kind of programming it does, you know, the kind of support it's been giving to families, um, the kind of issues that it has been addressing. It, has it been, you know, up until now, kind of basically living up to what your hope and expectations were in forming this organization? Right. Well, in the first five years when I was under house arrest, I was probably was much more involved, maybe on a daily basis. You know, I was trying to set up the, uh, the website and, and make sure that things are working because really this is an organization without any resources except the people and their, their enthusiasm and their determination to make sure that, you know, these families are cared for, that these prisoners we're reaching out to them, we're letting them know that they're not alone, that there are people who care about them and their plight. I want to make sure that that happens. And of course, we had the impacted family members and we have, you know, great people like Kathy and Steve and Mel Underbucky and, and Fred and others, those people who have been there also from day one. You know, right. I always tell, you know, when people ask me, what is the main difference in your case uh, from the others? Why you had that fortunate outcome? And I tell them I'm not really sure, you know, it's God's blessing. But also one of the main reasons I believe is that my case, our community, had already built these relationships with others, with non-Muslims. Actually, we had a daily demonstration, and none of the Muslims would come to it. It was always the non-Muslims who would come, the community members who would come and protest. And some of the jurors, you know, when they were interviewed after the verdict, where they didn't convict on a single count, they were asked, 
you know, why did he do that? You know, one of the reasons they said that they saw these people who are coming, they were not from his community, you know, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. his community. They right. were these are people who know him, and if that's what they're saying, we were very skeptical of the government's case. So, so I think building th these okay. relationships are extremely important, and I was hoping that this organization, when I left, this was my main concern, is it going to survive? So after five years, I'm very pleased to know that it is surviving. It is, going, <laughs> it is doing a lot of good, you know, especially on on uh, reaching out to prisoners and yes. getting the families once a year at least, you know, where they can uh, uh, get together and 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 talk about the, the different issues. And now we're hoping that it can go beyond that because, as I said, you know, for any successful issue and cause in the United States, it goes through phases. You know, David mm -hmm. Paul, uh wrote a book about this he calls it three phases in my book it's four phases the first phase is is the public education you need to get the public at least a sufficient number of them to know the issue and to be and to be uh, interested that's the the phase that i'm adding to this but the second one i think it's related to it, is the media you know that the media will pick up on this and they will start because that's your medium that's how you can get the people to know by having enough media and of course, when we did secret evidence, we didn't have the social media as it is today. So this is actually gives you more opportunities as well as less, because you need also access to the other uh, bigger media, especially in, in markets where you have TV and journalism and others. So and next is media. And then you go to the po political side. And the last stage is the, is the legal side, unfortunately. And that's what David Cole is, is, is arguing in his book, is that the law is the last one to change in society. You have to change minds first. Okay? Yeah. The politicians, because they they are vulnerable to people's votes, so they would have to change. And then the last thing is after the political landscape changes, then you get the law to change. Now, <clears throat> in our case, we did the same. We said political campaign, then the media campaign, then I'm sorry, we started with the public campaign, then the media campaign, then the political campaign. And then at the last thing, we got the law enough to to free everybody <coughs> under secret evidence at the time. Mazin was the last one to be freed, but still, it was still on the books. So we're trying to change this, and we got interrupted by 9-11. Now, to, 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 uh, to stop these cases, I know my friends here have introduced a, a bill, I think it's called the Ego Bill, and, and of course there are many others that need to be passed, but we're not going to get there to change that uh, uh, so that it will be reflected in the legal profession, in the courts, Unless we, you know, we take care of the other uh, campaigns, but the other campaigns need resources. Volunteers is not going to cut it. You know, I was fortunate enough at the time, you know, to really work on this with few friends and family, and you were one of them. We were there, there, you know, in a daily basis. You know, we were in Congress every week. I was visiting Congress every single week as a citizen lobbyist. We were able to get 129 Congress people to sign on to this, and for those who I have had difficulty i would find ways to approach them through friends through organizations some of them by by uh, raising funds you know to them political funds you don't have that kind of uh, activities you know with people that ne really needs a special kind of spirits or you have to uh, spend resources to do to do that but that's the uh, that's the, the job at hand here we need that's the task at hand we need to get enough people excited enough about this case that this is one of the most and crucial and significant uh, civil rights of our era. You know, what happened to these people should not be looked down as, as simply collateral damage. You know, right now we go back and say, well, what happened to the Japanese? Oh, we give them apology, and then we move on. No, we need to, we need, we need to, uh, we need to work on this here and now and right the wrongs and, 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 and those injustices, they have to be overturned. And we have to win this battle. We should, and if you're a Muslim, you shouldn't be afraid to speak your mind in the society that prides itself on First Amendment activities and on its freedom of speech and academic freedom and all that. You shouldn't be labeled simply by being because of your faith or association. That needs to change. That culture needs to change. And for that mm -hmm. to happen, you need this mobilization effort. You've been calling for this, but unfortunately, we haven't gotten to that because at the beginning, you need this these uh, firebrand these people who are willing to be at the forefront of this of this fight and then the others will come later so we need to start and that organization will hopefully be the vehicle to that anybody who wants to fight for justice in this country and to uh, right the wrongs they need to be a member of that organization they need to give it uh, it's uh, their best you know if not time and effort at least money and, and resources because this is how we're gonna uh, uh, advance this cause by pressing on these these campaigns the public campaign the media campaign the political campaign 
and eventually the legal one. Stephen, Kathy, the the segueing from what our brother just pointed out, which I wholeheartedly agree with, you know, he referenced the Eagle Act that uh, uh, has been introduced through uh, the, um, uh, the the legal network of of uh, humble, the very humble legal network of of CCF. Explain either one of you to, to the audience what that act is, uh, oh. that proposed act is, and what what you're hoping to accomplish through it, as well as, you know, I think it would be good to share some of the other things that CCF has been doing uh, that yeah. may not be aware of. Well, I wanted to mention that um, when we started studying these cases, we created a database written by Lynn Jackson, who, who, who did the Albany Resolution. She's also a professional database writer. So she wrote a database mm -hmm. and over, has over a thousand cases in it now. And we started studying all these cases using the analysis of preemptive prosecution, where they, um, that none of the targets actually did anything, that the government was trying to go after them out of fear that they might do something in the future. And so mm -hmm. we discovered that, um, 74% of those cases are purely preemptive where there was no crime committed at all other than being entrapped in a sting operation or something else that wouldn't normally be considered a crime. Um, and another 20% had some, some crime like fraud or maybe drug dealing, but wasn't really terrorist. And these were all called terrorist convictions. And we, out of that, from studying those cases, and we, we published a report called Inventing Terrorists, you can Google it. Mm -hmm. It'll come up. Um, it's available on our website as well as the ICNA Social Justice Council website. If you Google Inventing Terrorists, you should be able to get it there. Um, we just updated it last year. And when we studied how does the government do this, we came up with um, these three things that we incorporated into the Eagle Bill, which is changing the law on secret evidence, which is um, creating an actual entrapment defense and changing the law on the material support to terrorism. Um, and Steve maybe can go through um, those three things and talk a little bit about um, what we're trying to do with that bill. Steve? So the, I, the deal was that if Kathy would write the bill, I would try to get it passed in Congress. I think she got the better of the deal. <laughs> um, but basically, the ego bill <laughs> encompasses three um, three aspects. The one is that the material support for terrorism laws do not require intent to engage in violence, and so it's used as a trap to get people who, for example, contributed to a charity, believing that they were helping to relieve suffering, but the government could invent some kind of Un unforeseen consequence that uh, would benefit a terrorist organization and then claim that they were supporting terrorism. Uh, so the first part of the bill was to uh, require the proof of intent to uh, engage in terrorism or violence uh, in order to have a conviction. The second part was that there is no, um, at present, there's no codified defense of entrapment. It's all uh, court made law and the courts have gradually been eroding it until the point now where there is virtually no entrapment defense left uh, that is, is usable that in order to uh, to be able to claim it i suppose you would have to withdraw from the plot before you were ever arrested and uh, that is just not not usable it has been successful in any of these uh, entrapment cases so what the idea would be is to create a entrapment defense, which says basically that um, it would not be proper for the government to try to entrap somebody unless the uh, target had already taken significant steps toward engaging criminal activity. That will re-anchor the, the, uh, the government, the FBI's um, uh, actions uh, in back to, to uh, actual crime rather than on political activity or perceived dangerousness or some of the other things that they seem to use now as a justification for targeting people. 
And the third thing I think comes in a large part of, of these cases where the FBI uh, tilts the playing field, tilts the trial court by um, siphoning large amounts of classified information to a trial judge before the trial uh, to prejudice the mind of the judge. And um, the d defense has no way to confront that. And we certainly saw in our case, in the Aref case, how damaging that was because we believe that they gave the trial judge information that suggested that Yassin was a, um, uh, a, a bummer called uh, Mohammed Yassin, uh, which we believe was absolutely incorrect. And actually, we know that it was incorrect because Mohammed Yassin was an Al Qaeda bomber and he died uh, four years after the trial, so he couldn't possibly be Yassin. Nonetheless, if they did that, we have no proof of it because we don't know what they gave the judge. Um, that would have been very damaging to his case. So the third part of the ego bill is to say that no classified evidence should be given uh, under the Classified Information Procedure Act to a trial judge without sharing it with a security cleared defense counsel. So those would be the three elements that we are, uh, have put together into this bill, which we're calling the ego bill. Okay. Can I say something and, uh, about now, movie? I'm... Sure, go ahead. Sorry, what? Are yeah, you I, finished? Uh, I want to add finished? something to what Steve said okay. All right. about the, the law because I think it's relevant. Uh, during my trial, we had something called jury instruction 18. And jury instruction 18 was, was based on a, uh, a motion. This is the only motion, by the way, that we won out of maybe a thousand motions that were filed. But it was very, very crucial, very significant because that motion in which the judge agreed and he wrote beautiful response to it, and I want people to actually go in and dig it up and, and read it, in which he says intent is absolutely needed here. And it was based also on this, in this jury instruction that they couldn't convict. Now this jury instruction was used in the aftermath uh, in appeals uh, for other cases. So my lawyer told me, I don't know this for, you know, I don't have the exact bill. They told me that they sh changed the law based on your trial. So this is this was called another, and I, I saw one hearing in which the uh, the guy who was in charge of the criminal division he talked he talked about what he's called Alarian uh, instruction in which that we cannot win with this instruction. So I think I want I think they need to go and look up this motion and look up this jury instruction because it's written in legal ways and I think it's 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 plausible that that people would agree to it that intent is you know what's called mensury is absolutely needed and and, and necessary. Because the judge gives several examples. He said, you can convict, in, in the judge's uh, uh, opinion, he said, you can convict my mother by riding uh, in a taxi uh, if that taxi does, you know, ABC. So you cannot do that. There has to be an, an element of intent here for this to take place. So I believe that this is very, very important. And if that uh, element is there uh, right and center, if that jury instruction is there right and center, most of these cases will be overturned. The, the problem is... Exactly. That with the you're right but the with the material support for terrorism laws that went up to the supreme court and after your case in 2010 in the humanitarian law project case the supreme court said you don't have to have that intent so but we changed that the law. That's so exactly after that right yeah, after that the aclu tried to put that intent back into the law but that didn't go anywhere and now we're trying to do it again right Okay, before we move on to closing thoughts from each of you, I want to uh, ask um, Steve and especially Kathy, especially given the fact that you are still uh, um, uh, practicing um, on a daily basis uh, and you are, as we all are, very much aware of the impact that this uh, pandemic is having on our society uh, as a whole. There is a, a added concern, and for good reason, of the impact that it's having on penal institutions. Um, for example, the uh, FMC Carswell, where Dr. Afia Siddiqui is imprisoned, uh, where Lynn Stewart was uh, before, she, before her release. Um, there's a case of a young woman, a Native American, 30 years of age, pregnant, under a two-year sentence who ended up, up dying from COVID-19 from that institution. And um, because of the special 
uh, the special imprisonment conditions that Afia is under. She has had no contact with her family for at least two years now. And there's obvious concern from family, from supporters like myself on what her condition is. Um, beyond Afia, you know, this issue of uh, this, this pandemic's impact on institutions. So you, do you have anything that you can uh, share in, in the way of concern about this? Yeah, y yesterday, well, a couple days ago, we actually, CCF, we did a webinar um, that's available through our Facebook page, Coalition for Civil Freedoms. It was recorded, and we talked specifically about COVID in the federal prisons and what we're trying to do about it, so people could access that for more in-depth. We had a former prisoner who was in the communications management unit with a lot of our prisoners that we support who was, who was on the show with us talking about what it's like from the inside when he was there. and. Um, one of the things I've been doing a lot of lately is we, we looked at the, the people that we support, we looked at which ones of them are particularly vulnerable to the virus, so over 65 or have underlying medical conditions that make them at high risk from COVID-19. And so we've been preparing and filing compassionate release motions for those people. And we're still, um, getting going. We filed um, one and I'm about to file three more this week and our other cooperating attorney Amit Gupta is about to file one in the Chicago Federal Court this week coming up and then we have a bunch more that we're preparing as well. So um, we're hopeful that at least some of those will get granted, especially the people that don't have a lot of time left to serve on their sentences anyway and are at extreme risk. Um, some of the facilities have these huge outbreaks and other BOP facilities, Bureau of Prison facilities, they're just not testing. So there could be lots of cases that we don't know about. But as it is, the curve, I've been graphing it every day, the curve is going up really steeply um, over the last couple of weeks in the prisons. Every day there's a new facility that has reported cases, and there's a lot more cases that aren't reported because they're not actually testing, except for in a few facilities. So it's a huge problem. So far, I think 46 federal inmates have died and um, many more people are at risk from that. And uh, do you have any, uh, you have an update on the on the condition of Ibrahim el Gabrani? Oh, Ibrahim el Gabrani is one of the people I wrote to about doing a compassionate release motion. He has been incarcerated since 1993 in an early sting case, really unfair. He was supposed to get out last year. I mean, next year. He's supposed to get out next year. He was in a facility, Oakdale, that has a lot of cases, and he got COVID-19, and he has been on a ventilator for weeks now. Um, we heard that a, about a week or two ago that they were going to try to take him off of the ventilator. I haven't heard an update since then, so we've been praying for him. Um, and hoping that he can come off of that ventilator and survive. Um, I haven't gotten an update as to whether he's gotten off of the ventilator yet or not. Okay, let's let's move on to closing uh, thoughts. Um, let's begin with you, Steve. Any closing thought you'd like to share with the audience? Well, I, I've been spending time down in Congress trying to get the ego bill passed, and I, I realize in Right now, this is a very uphill battle. Um, we are not a huge number of people. Uh, on, we're, say, 200, 300 prisoners that we're talking about. And um, I think we have a, lot of, a long way to go before we've convinced the politicians, the American public, that it is worth um, time and effort to go back and try to get these people out of jail. I'm, I constantly go back to the original COINTELPRO that went on in the 1960s, and mm -hmm. there were hearings afterwards in which they found that, that the tactics that were being used by the FBI were just wrong and, and illegal and uh, must be stopped. But having said that and having put restrictions on the FBI in terms of what they could do to do the, the kind of preemptive prosecutions we're talking about here, they nonetheless then went back and did not make a huge effort to get those people that had been wrongfully convicted and are in jail out. They, there are people still there. 
after 40 years that we should have gotten out. And I fear very much that we're going to end up in the same thing, mm -hmm. that we may eventually get to the point where we will be able to slow down what the FBI is doing. But I, uh, getting people out of jail is another issue that just bothers me and worries me constantly. I don't know how we're going to do it. Brother Sammy, closing thought. First, I want to thank you for this opportunity. And thanks, Steve and Kathy, for what they have been doing with CCF. I just want to address everyone who's watching and those who are beyond. You know, we are at, uh, we are at a very critical uh, juncture in time and history with this COVID. And it shows how life is fragile. Uh, we are very busy in our lives. And we sometimes we don't take a moment to reflect upon what's really important. The people in prison are human beings who have feelings, who deserve dignity and deserve freedom and deserve to be with their families. Their families are suffering in silence. And this is this address is to the American Muslim community. It's them. This, this, anybody could have been that person. If the government chose for that person within the Muslim community to be the target, they would have found anything or they would have manufactured anything to get him in jail to make an example out of him. For us to turn our backs on these people and their families is unconscionable, is really very regrettable. regrettable. So what I want like them to do is, uh, if they can't be involved physically or, or effort or time, at least they can support financially. This is a monumental effort that we need to do. To overturn these injustices, it needs a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of resources put together and work day and night and very hard to get this done. And my message to them is that you could see how life now people cannot afford to be two weeks or three weeks or two months or three months confined to their house, their own houses, sleeping on their own beds, eating whenever they want, whatever food they like. They cannot even fathom that. They cannot live in that. Right. Just imagine your brothers and sisters sitting in a room that is hardly, you know, 50 feet square day in and day out, they can't see the sun. And they, every moment of their life is under scrutiny, under control. They are stripped of their humanity, of their privacy. That's the type, and this is not just for two months or three months. This is for years upon years and sometimes for life, for nothing. For nothing they've done except that they, 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 they were Muslims. They just had, had, had association with Islam. So if you don't agree with that, then you need to do their, your part. And it's not more than just giving support, moral support, financial support, but hopefully even getting involved yourself. Alhamdulillah. Kathy. Yes, I, I wholeheartedly support everything Dr. Sami just said, and I'm really glad to be working with all of you. Um, we've been doing this for quite a while now, and it's a long haul, but I think that over the last few years, there's been more recognition of the human rights of prisoners and more you know, the whole criminal justice reform movement, there's been a big move to get people out of prison in general. And I'm hopeful that as we make alliances with that movement, which we have been starting to do, um, that we will be able to have our prisoners be part of that criminal justice reform. And so I'm hopeful we're, our last family conference was the best ever. It felt very empowering to all the people. It was the biggest ever. Um, and so we're, we're growing slowly little little by little i think we will eventually get some justice for our people get them out alhamdulillah you know um my my own closing thoughts are as follows no, number one i am i i thank allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for uh for blessing me to uh come into contact with folk like yourselves um we, we have friendships now, all of us that go back a number of years. Uh, these are very meaningful friendships that are rooted in the pursuit of justice, peace through justice uh, in this society that we're in. And it's a, it's a never ending struggle. Um, my hope is that more people will be inspired by struggles like this. More people will be inspired especially during times when everything is being done by extremists on so,
from on so many fronts to divide people to 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 uh, uh, create such deep fissures that it makes it impossible for human beings to be able to see their common humanity and work together for the common good. You know, the, the what CCF, uh, the Coalition for Civil Freedoms, National Coalition to Protect Civil Freedoms, Project Salam, uh, the uh, the Muslim Solidarity Committee. I mean, these are organizations that uh, reflect that that the, the beauty of of folk being able to come together for a common cause, recognizing that common thread that unites us all. Um, I was about to do something this, I had, in fact, I had announced it. I had announced it, what, two or three months ago that it with the next Ramadan, the Ramadan we're in right now, I was gonna do something that I had never done before. You know, organizations, uh, they look, Muslim organizations really look, and I've discovered that many non-Muslim organizations, they look to the month of Ramadan to really uh, uh, generate uh, material support, monetary support from the Muslim community. And while, while we all, as especially small organizations, have this preoccupation, my, 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 my love and respect and commitment to the work of, of CCF is such that, you know, I had announced two or three months ago that this coming Ramadan, I was going to be uh, inviting those who we have connections with through the work we've been doing in different parts of the country to allow us to have a fundraising event that would split the funds 50-50 between the Afia Foundation and CCF. I had never, uh, you know, endeavored uh, even verbally to do something like that before. But that is a reflection of how deeply I feel, how deeply I value the work of CCF and and feel privileged to be connected to it as, as one of the founding members. Uh, uh, thanks to Brother Sammy for the invitation for me to be, to be on board. I say all that to say, you know, I, I've, I've also said and to the Muslims who see this, uh, uh, this, this, this broadcast, and to the non-Muslim friends of ours who see this broadcast, who value the work, the efforts, you know, the sacrifices by the grace of Allah made by their brother Salah Khan, who value my opinion, I say I have said that this organization, the, uh, the Coalition for Civil Freedoms and the Afia Foundation are two of the most important organizations in the United States of America that you should be occasionally at least giving your support to. You should be giving your support to these, the, 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 these organizations. So, so please take that to heart, O Muslims, during the, in the, in the, in the latter part of this month of, of Ramadan. Um, help the, 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 the Afia Foundation, help the, the Coalition for Civil Freedoms, and yes, yeah, help Project Salam, you know, uh, continue to do the work that we have been doing and help us to, uh, to, do, it, to do it better, to take it to the next level. Uh, because this, this, um, this, this challenge that we all face is not going to go away anytime soon. And as Frantz Fanon, uh, that, that uh, that, that amazing revolutionary psychiatrist from Martinique said in his book, uh, uh, Wretched of the Earth, mm -hmm. said each generation must out of relative obscurity, discover its mission, fulfill it or betray it. Mm -hmm. That was the case when he wrote those words that remains the case to this day. There is no, there, there, there is no neutral ground. You, you're either part of the struggle to bring about positive change or you are supporting the other side and maintaining a very corrupt and destabilizing and very dangerous status quo. So may Allah bless us to be on the right side of history, um, support these efforts in whatever possible way you can. I wanna close by thanking again, Salam Media for inviting me to this platform and um, Inshallah ta'ala, the struggle will continue. Thank you for listening. Peace be unto you. 
Assalamu alaikum.